He was king by the age of nine, a boy who kept a chronicle of his life and a short reign that was dominated by nobles of the period. It said he was athletic on the field yet intellectual off it, a boy who never quite made it to the power and might his father had adhered to. Yet plenty believed he certainly had the temperament to follow in those footsteps. So was he a disjointed child or a breath of fresh air to the monarchy? We now look at the life of Edward Tudor. The son of King Henry VIII, Edward was born on 12th of October 1537 at Hampton Court Palace. His mother was Henry's third wife, Jane Seymour. This was a great time of joy for Henry, and the one thing he had always desired was now placed in front of him. Not only was this the birth of a boy, but a true male heir, something that he had been denied after many years of trying. Throughout the country, people celebrated this great news. In church, to deums were sung and outside across the country, bonfires were lit, along with shot being fired from the tower late into the evening. Letters were sent out announcing the birth of a prince and conceived in the most lawful matrimony between my lord the king's majesty and us. Edward was christened on the 15th of October with his half-sisters, the 21-year-old Lady Mary as godmother and the four-year-old Lady Elizabeth, carrying the white robe that would be used at the ceremony. The Garter King of Arms proclaimed the new prince as the Duke of Cornwall and Earl of Chester. However, sadness was to follow. Queen Jane fell ill on October 23rd. She had suffered throughout the pregnancy and died of what was thought to be postnatal complications. Henry's happiness was now one of complete and utter sadness. A letter he wrote to Francis the First of France confirmed his plight, saying, Divine Providence hath mingled my joy with bitterness of the death of her who brought me this happiness. Edward began life as a healthy baby. He seemed strong and robust, a great sign of the times. Henry was over the moon about his new offspring, publicly showing him upon a balcony to the throngs of people below. In September 1538, the Lord Chancellor Lord Audley reported Edward's rapid growth and vigour, and others stated that Edward was tall and perhaps more importantly, a very happy child. But there was always rumours about his health and like most youngsters, he had his fair share of ailments. At the age of four, he suffered a life-threatening disease known as quartan fever. This was a parasitic ailment that caused malaria in humans. However, he fully recovered and continued to be the most talked about boy in court. Edward was initially placed in the care of Margaret Bryan, a lady mistress of the prince's household. Some years later in his chronicle, he described his upbringing as among the women. For Henry, though, nothing could be left to chance. He insisted on certain standards and cleanliness, and his demands would be met to the letter. Edward was described by visitors as a contented child. He was given lavish toys, and not many children can call upon their own troop of minstrels for entertainment. But nothing was spared to ensure that this boy, in Henry's eyes, was the realm's most precious jewel. He began his education at the age of six. He was supervised by Richard Cox and John Cheek, who taught the young prince a multitude of subjects. These included the learning of tongues of the scripture, philosophy and sciences. He also received tuition from Elizabeth's tutor, Roger Ascom and Jean Belmain, learning French, Spanish and Italian. On the fun side of his education, he learned to play the lute and virginals, which was a type of 16th century harpsichord. He had time for hobbies and collections, as with most boys throughout time. He loved globes and maps and even collected coins. As for his religion, it is thought that most of his teachings would be based around the new reforming agenda, although earlier in life it's thought that Catholicism was the order of the day. Both of Edward's sisters loved their new little brother, and visits were very often. Gifts were brought to him. On one occasion, a shirt was given, designed and created by Elizabeth. As for Mary, well, although he loved her, he did not find pleasure in her foreign dances. But later in life, in 1546, he wrote to her declaring his love and saying he actually loved her the most. In 1543, Henry invited his children to spend Christmas with him, signalling his reconciliation with his daughters, whom he had made illegitimate and disinherited. The following spring, he restored them to their place in the succession with the Third Succession Act, which also provided for a Regency Council during Edward's minority. Harmony within Henry's household was something to celebrate. It wasn't every day you'd see a wry smile on his face. 
However, much of the adoration displayed was attributed to Catherine Parr. She was a lady who Edward adored. He called her his most dear mother. This was no normal upbringing, as you can imagine. His surroundings and possessions were fitting of a king, never mind a prince. Most children today back their books with paper. For Edward, his were encrusted with precious jewels and gold. His friends all of noble birth included Barnaby Fitzpatrick. He was son of an Irish peer and he became a close and lasting friend, even though at the time he was Edward's whipping boy. This was a boy educated alongside a prince and in early modern Europe, he would receive corporal punishment for the prince's transgressions in his presence. Yet like his father, Edward held a fascination of military arts and many of his portraits show him wearing a gold dagger with a jeweled hilt. This became an imitation of Henry. Edward's chronicle also detailed great English campaigns against the old enemies of Scotland and France. On the 1st of July 1543, Henry VIII signed a treaty of Greenwich with the Scots, sealing the peace with Edward's betrothal to the seven-month-old Mary, Queen of Scots. But the Scots were in a weak bargaining position after their defeat at Solway Moss the previous November, and Henry, seeking to unite the two realms, stipulated that Mary be handed over to him and be brought up in England. However, the Scots thought better and by December 1543 renewed their alliance with France. Henry, well, was a tad angry and possibly to the point of fuming. He ordered Edward's uncle, Edward Seymour, the Earl of Hertford, to invade Scotland. Put all to fire and sword, burn Edinburgh town. So raised and defaced when you have sacked and gotten what ye can of it, as there may remain forever a perpetual memory of the vengeance of God lightened upon them for their falsehood and disloyalty. In other words, just destroy them. Seymour responded with the most savage campaign ever launched by the English against the Scots. It came to be known as the Rough Wooing and continued into the reign of Edward himself. On the 10th of January 1547, Edward wrote to his father and stepmother with thanks for the gifts he had received in the new year. These were both portraits, but the same day sad news reached Edward of the death of his father. At the age of just nine years old, Edward was now king. Sir Anthony Brown, the master of the horse, rode to collect Edward from Hartford and brought him to Enfield, where Lady Elizabeth was living. He and Elizabeth were then told of the death of their father and heard a reading of the will. It would be on January 31st that the Lord Chancellor announced Henry's death to Parliament. Only now would steps be taken to indicate that the new king was to be crowned Edward VI. Edward was then taken to the Tower of London. Shots rang out across the capital and the next day the nobles of the land gave respect to the new king and as for Seymour, he was presented as the protector. Henry VIII was buried on the 16th of February by the side of his favourite wife, Jane Seymour, at Windsor. On the eve of the coronation, Edward travelled on a horse from the Tower to the Palace of Westminster. Huge crowds turned out and for a young boy, this must have been an overwhelming moment. Edward was crowned at Westminster Abbey just four days later on Sunday the 20th of February. The actual ceremony was shortened. The reason given was due to the new king being still of tender age and also because the Reformation had seen some of the rituals as inappropriate. The service was conducted by Cranmer and he affirmed the royal supremacy upon Edward, calling him a second Josiah, along with urging the new king to continue the Reformation of the Church of England. At Westminster Hall after the coronation, Edward was presented at a banquet in his honour. He later recalled that he dined with his crown on his head. Henry VIII's will named 16 executors who were to act as Edward's counsel until he reached the age of 18. The will itself was a constitutional document and significant in being created throughout the 1530s and 40s. It would affect ongoing politics between England and Scotland throughout the 16th century. The main part was the succession to the next three monarchs of the House of Tudor. Although Henry, when alive, had expressed an opinion to not have any of his so-called illegitimate children a right to rule, this thought was again changed in December of 1546. Henry this time confirmed the line of succession as Edward, Mary and Elizabeth, and following them the Grey and Suffolk families. The will was read, stamped and sealed on 27th of January 1547, at the time, Henry was so ill he was unable to speak, and his death came within hours. Henry never stipulated who, if anyone, should become protector to Edward, 
instead of leaving this decision to the government of the day. However, on the 4th of February, the executors chose to invest almost regal power in Edward Seymour, now the Duke of Somerset. 13 out of the 16 agreed to his appointment as protector, which they justified as their joint decision by virtue of the authority of Henry's will. Somerset's takeover of power was smooth and efficient. The imperial ambassador, Francois van der Delft, reported that he governs everything absolutely. But Paget, who had been operating as his secretary, predicted trouble from a man called John Dudley, Viscount Lyle. He'd had a recent rise in stature to the Earl of Warwick in the share-out of honours. It was now Thomas Seymour would set about his plan of action. He was the king's uncle and made demands above his station, including a greater share of power. Somerset tried to quell his brother by offering an appointment to the Lord Admiralship and a seat at the Privy Council. But this meant nothing to Thomas, and his scheming continued. Thomas started giving Edward pocket money and told him that he should release the protector as he was making him a beggarly king, and now was the time to rule himself. But Edward denied his reasoning and ignored the claims. In 1547, Thomas secretly married Henry VIII's widow, Catherine Parr, whose household included the then 11-year-old Lady Jane Grey and the 13-year-old Lady Elizabeth. Yet Thomas dug a hole for himself in the summer of 1548. Catherine, who was pregnant at the time, found him embracing Lady Elizabeth. Almost immediately, Elizabeth was removed from the house. By September, Catherine herself had died just shortly after childbirth. Thomas didn't need an incentive to resume his attentions to Elizabeth, initially by letter, and with plans now to marry her. Although Elizabeth showed interest, she was unwilling to take the stand unless permitted by the council. Enough was enough though and in January 1549 Thomas Seymour was arrested on a variety of charges, including embezzlement of monies from the mint. The king testified about the pocket money given to him by Thomas, yet there was little evidence to charge Thomas with treason. Instead, he was attained and condemned to death. Thomas Seymour lost his head on the 20th of March 1549. After April 1549, a series of armed revolts broke out, fueled by various religious and agrarian grievances. The two most serious rebellions, which required major military intervention to put down, were in Devon and Cornwall and Norfolk. There was unrest around the country. Somerset, who was once claimed to be a great military man, would now come back to haunt him. It was said that Somerset was sympathetic to the rebel cause, and even though he had sent out commissions to investigate, the events were taken as a colossal failure of government, and the council laid the responsibility at the protector's door. By the 1st of October 1549, Somerset had been alerted that his rule faced a serious threat. He issued a proclamation calling for assistance. He took Edward and withdrew for safety to the fortified Windsor Castle, where Edward wrote, Me thinks I am in prison. He had overstepped his authority this time and the council were now in no mood for further agitation by this man. He was arrested and brought before the king. Edward, who read through the charges, had him removed and replaced with John Dudley, the Earl of Warwick. Somerset was released from the tower, however suspicions grew that he planned to bring down Dudley. Not the brightest thing to do, but it all ended badly for him and he was executed in January 1552. As for Edward, in his chronicle, he wrote... The Duke of Somerset had his head cut off upon Tower Hill between 8 and 9 o'clock in the morning. Somerset's successor was John Dudley, the Earl of Warwick, made Duke of Northumberland in 1551. He was said to have pinned his hopes on the King's strong Protestantism and claimed that Edward was now old enough to rule in person. This was a move that not only enabled him to get closer to Edward, but it would also give him full control over the Privy Chamber. Although Warwick was not to become the new protector, he was now clearly the head of government. Warwick was careful to make sure he always commanded a majority of councillors. He encouraged a working council and used it to legitimise his authority. Warwick's handling of events was much different to that of Somerset. He realised that England could no longer support the cost of wars. The finances of the kingdom were in a mess and it was something that had to be stabilised. By 1552, trade started to improve and confidence was restored. The reformation that had begun under Henry VIII continued with Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who had introduced a series of religious reforms that revolutionised the English Church, from one that while rejecting papal supremacy, to one that was institutionally Protestant. 
something Edward wanted and was now resumed with vigour. Edward encouraged and began to exert more pressure and influence as the supreme head of the church. In 1551 and the following year, Cranmer rewrote the Book of Common Prayer with new laws and statements, pulled together and called the 42 Articles. This edition quelled any other's views to the point and had reformed religion to a new status. To this day, the Prayer Book of 1552 remains the foundation of the Church of England's services. Yet Cranmer could not implement all the reforms. By spring of 1553, it was clear Edward was dying and the Reformation was stalled for the foreseeable future. In February 1553, Edward VI became ill and by June, after several improvements and relapses, he was in a hopeless condition. Fears now spread that if he died, Mary would come to the throne and completely disregard the Reformation plans set out. She was, after all, a staunch Catholic. This would spread fear not only amongst Edward's advisers, but Edward himself. Edward opposed Mary's succession. It wasn't just religion that held him back, but also the legitimacy of her becoming queen. The same rule also applied to Elizabeth. He composed a draft document headed My Devise for the Succession, in which he undertook to change the succession, most probably inspired by his father, Henry VIII's precedent. He passed over the claims of his half-sisters and at last settled the crown on his first cousin, once removed, the 16-year-old Lady Jane Grey, who on the 25th of May 1553 had married Lord Guilford Dudley, a younger son of the Duke of Northumberland. Edward eventually got his way. Not only was the document to receive government backing, but he also commanded leading counsellors and lawyers to sign a bond in his presence, in which they agreed faithfully to perform Edward's will after his death. January 1553, with a fever and cough, Edward gradually worsened, his health now deteriorating at speed. Although he had a little respite in April, his health worsened again. Reports suggest that Edward was suffering most horrendously. He had ejections from his mouth and his legs were so swollen he had to lay down for any sort of comfort. His physicians said he was beyond care and unable to resist the oncoming of death. Edward made his final appearance in public on the 1st of July and he showed himself at his window in Greenwich Palace, horrifying those who saw him by his thin and wasted condition. During the next two days, large crowds arrived hoping to see the king again, but this never occurred. Edward died at the age of 15 at Greenwich Palace at 8pm on the 6th of July, 1553. His last words were, I am faint, Lord have mercy upon me and take my spirit. He was buried in the Henry VII Lady Chapel at Westminster Abbey on the 8th of August, 1553, with reformed rites performed by Thomas Cranmer. In the intervening days, it would become a battle between Mary and the newly appointed Lady Jane Grey as Queen. The power of Mary and her supporters was very much underestimated, and the Privy Council realised that it had made a terrible mistake. The Earl of Arundel and the Earl of Pembroke and the Council proclaimed Mary as Queen. Jane's nine-day reign came to an end on July the 19th. Although Northumberland also proclaimed Mary, it would not be enough to gain favour and he was finally arrested and beheaded on the 22nd of August. As for Jane Grey, she followed him to the scaffold on the 12th of February, 1554. Although Edward was a king for just a few years, his reign saw a full introduction to Protestantism. The son of the mighty Henry VIII, his goal was to follow in his father's footsteps and continue the dynasty in quite possibly the same way as he had been brought to recognise. His life was dominated by nobles and others all seeking a way into the inner sanctum, yet he was controlled by a council of which Edward Seymour would become his protector. Seymour, though, was a brutal man, and this was something that perhaps was conveyed to Edward, and in doing so, helped him establish his growing reputation. The Reformation, which had been instigated by his father, continued under Edward. His hatred of Catholics and their churches gave him an excuse to take property, decoration and colour, leaving a blank canvas for all their followers. By the time of his teenage years, Edward was taking more notice of government matters. He was encouraged to the point of taking a view and additionally adding comments to the documents. He was quite possibly the first king to keep a diary or a chronicle, as it was called. 
Edward demonstrated self-discipline in creating this record which reveals an insight into the young man's mind and describes many events that affected him through life. But the main fear for everyone in the country was if Edward died, the succession would pass to Mary and she was a Catholic. But even then Edward attempted to continue his Protestant ways by declaring Lady Jane to be the new Queen. The one item that set Edward apart from his others was his devise for the succession, a document that went through many changes. He excluded his sister Mary and Elizabeth, although Elizabeth had conformed to his Protestant beliefs. It turned out to be a recipe for disaster. The boy king with a famous father was never able to reach the heights of his predecessor. His reign was dominated by others and the infighting and transitions of power dominated his court. Edward VI was nothing more than a front in a time of great change. Thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it. For more amazing stories, join me today on Benefit by Subscribing and check out both the videos coming up on the screen right now. And I'll see you again soon here on the History Roadshow. Show.